Hi, everybody. I'm Dr. Duke. Welcome to Freedom Project Media. Today, we begin our first of a four-part series on the complicated, contentious issue of abortion. We're going to look at the history of abortion. We're going to look at how abortion became legal. We're going to look at the moral and ethical and philosophical ramifications about abortion. Uh, too often, we have the abortion, uh, the abortion debate in this culture and in world culture without any recognition of where it came from or how historically it's been dealt with or what are the, the broader abiding issues that transcend individual, uh, individual countries or individual uh, political parties. So we're going to try to at least situate the abortion debate, the abortion discussion in some good history, some good philosophy. Uh, and along the way, I want to uh, make some critical distinctions of why our thinking on abortion is so muddled, why we're, uh, it seems like, we're arguing at each other from two radical different ways, that what one side means about rights is exactly what the, op the opposite of what the other side means. I'd like to try to cut through some of that. Probably I'm probably not going to answer the question any better than anybody else has. Um, I'm going to come down radically on the side of pro-life here uh, because I think that morally and ethically, notwithstanding the legal ramifications, morally and ethically it's the only place to be. And I thought that maybe instead of, well, by the end of the hour we'll, be start, we'll start talking about some abortion throughout history, how uh, it became legal, what ancient cultures, what ancient aspects of Western culture thought about it moving forward. So we're going to give you the next two segments, a little bit of history. Uh, but before I do that, I want to just frame the issue around a number of questions, five or six different statements about the nature of abortion, some of the more famous ones. The first is, abortion and racism are both symptoms of a fundamental human error. The error is thinking that when someone stands in the way of our wants, we can justify getting that person out of our lives. Abortion and racism stem from the same poisonous root. Selfishness. So this is Alveda King, a uh, relative of, of Dr. Martin Luther King. And I think this is an absolutely compelling argument because it is an argument of social justice. It is an argument that the left in most any other instance would find acceptable. The atheist left, the radical left, the progressive left. If we were, if, if Mrs. King applied this only to racism and racial disharmony, there would not be a, a dissenting voice among the left. However, she wisely and correctly, I think, ties the issue of abortion to slavery and to racism. Abortion, she says, and racism are both symptoms of a fundamental human error. And we know what the error is with regards to racism. That error is ignorance. That error is politicization. That error is the refusal to acknowledge the humanity of somebody else. That error is uh, a misguided sense of self that leads to a diminution, an unnecessary and unjustified diminution of the other. This is exactly what racism is. And again, no social justice theorist on the left is going to argue with that. Uh, and it's ironic, isn't it? When we think about race relations in the world and in the Western culture today and, and with regards to the social justice progressive warriors, uh, notice what we're doing in that regard. We are taking race away from the notion that, it is, that racism is ignorance. We are moving beyond the notion that, race, that racism is somehow uh, injustice alone. We're starting to associate racism with inherent qualities again. In other, in other words, we are re-racializing racial discourse. With things like white privilege, we are now beginning to argue that race isn't just about about ignorance anymore. Race isn't just misunderstandings about race aren't just anymore uh, about bigotry and ignorance and foolishness and selfishness. Now we're trying to argue that it's somehow inherent. And that's exactly what we do with abortion rights. Uh, that because a woman alone can be a mother and because a, mother a woman can only be the mother of the baby she's impregnated with, therefore she has absolute control over that baby. Go back to Alveda King's quote again here for a moment. Abortion and racism are both symptoms of a critical, glaring, fundamental human error. The error is thinking that when someone stands in the way of what we want, we can justify getting that person out of our lives. That's exactly what this is, to remove bigotry from society, to scrub it from society, to remove people with bigoted opinions from public office or, from, or silencing them in schools. Uh, it's the same argument here, right? That if a child, an infant in the womb is uncomfortable for us, or if it's something that stands in the way of something else that we want, we can justify getting that person out of our lives. Abortion and racism stem from the same poisonous root, selfishness. And I think she really hits it out of the park there. When you think about the kind of ignorance and the kind of solipsism that leads to racism, the kind of uh, intolerance and bigotry, it is nothing more than what she calls it. It is selfishness. Uh, in fact, selfishness is the root of so many of our sins. If we think back to the teachings of Christ, uh, it, it seems to me that Christ's teachings, if you boiled them down to one word, would be selflessness. 
Now, this radical need to put the other first, it is the foundation of almost all Judeo-Christian philosophy. Almost all Western culture has been built over the last 2,000 years on that notion. And it always extended in Christ's arguments to the weakest to those who were the most vulnerable. And again, in human society, there are none more vulnerable than those who have yet to be born. There are none no vulnerable, more vulnerable than those who cannot speak for themselves, who have no voice, who have no constituency, who have no representation, who we're being told now, whose life alone depends on the, the whim of the mother. It's a remarkable station, a situation. What Mrs. King says is exactly right. Selfishness is the root of this. If we separate all the legalisms, and I'm gonna make a big deal about this, separating the legal question. Very often when you back pro-abortionists into corners, they'll come back with the legal argument. Sooner or later, when you keep probing them up upon the fundamentally selfish, the fundamentally antisocial, the fundamentally unjust nature of destroying life in the womb, they default to, well, it was legal. These are the same progressives, by the way, who scoff at the uh, 18th and 7th, 17th and 18th century uh, um, early American colonials who made the argument that slavery was moral and legal, that say slavery was for the greater good. We laugh at that, but when we see this argument here op opposed to the unborn, uh, the same progressives can't seem to make the connection. Go to the second quote here. B Mrs. King rightly understands that this is a, two things, that this is a question of selfishness, to be selfless or selfish, number one. And number two, it is also a question of the parallelism between the way we see racism and the way we treat the unborn. Go to Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who was one of the first pioneering feminists. She's really, if, if there was first wave feminism 30, 40, 50 years ago, you could call this pre-first feminism. These are the, the suffragettes. These are some of the women who marched for women's rights and women's representation. These were not women who argued that m women were property or that women should be owned or that women in some way shouldn't have a voice in their own health. That was not the argument at all. Elizabeth Cady Stanton made the really, really rather profound statement. When we consider that women are treated as property, it is degrading to women that we should treat our children as property to be disposed of as we see fit. And that's exactly right. What are women fighting for? And it's a noble struggle. What have women fought for for the entire 20th century? The right not to be property, the right to be independent in their attitudes and their outlooks and their worldviews. And by the way, that right never throughout, it, whether we granted them to minority or we enfranchised African Americans with those rights or the colonists seized those rights from the, the, home, the, king, the, the home kingdom, Mother England, or all the way to Magna Carta, all the way down back through our history. This is a really important point. When we consider anybody who is treated as property, it's degrading to those people that we should allow them to shake off their change, chains by so degrading others. We we did not grant slaves the right to kill once we freed them. We did not grant serfs the right to murder once they were liberated from their plantations and their masters. The idea that we would liberate women from objectivity, from the idea that they are somehow property, and then immediately allow them to turn around and dispose of their unborn children as if they were property is a staggering admission. And again, take it way beyond the realm. I think another thing, we, we do too little of this also. We very seldom take the abortion issue beyond the realm of abortion, beyond the realm of dem the Democrat Party politics, for instance, or what the Supreme Court said in Roe versus Wade, we very seldom take it beyond that and look at it in the con concept of larger and oftentimes parallel movements in human history, the struggle for freedom, the struggle against racism, the struggle for civil rights. There's a big difference. I think one of the ways you can frame the modern discussion about abortion is the difference between civil rights and social justice. Civil rights, of course, as we know, was a movement that asked for empowerment. It asked for acceptance, equality, greater communication, greater understanding, greater tolerance. It called for a world, in the words of Martin Luther King Jr., uh, beyond color, a world where we will not see each other in such superficial terms. That's civil, ju uh, civil rights. Social justice, however, is a radical rethinking of the civil rights movement. It, it, it claims to want the same ambitions, liberation, freedom, tolerance, understanding, and peace, and yet they do it in utterly divisive ways by, again, shifting racist terms to the opposition, by using the same tactics of bigots and racists to shut down the conversation of others, by throwing and hurling racial epithets around to anybody who disagrees with them. You, uh, you don't agree with my social justice paradigm that says we must build black-only dorms on college campuses, well, then you are a bigot. In other words, you're engaging in the same kind of language of the plantation older, the same kind of language of the oppressor. Same thing happens here with abortion. 
There is civil rights for women's health. And then there is the question of legalizing murder, or uh, as Elizabeth Cady Stanton says, allowing women to treat their unborn babies the same way women they have claimed they have been treated down through the centuries. When we consider that women are treated as property, it is equally degrading to women that we should treat our children as property to be disposed of as we see fit. That's a remarkable observation, right? That we, nobody has that right. And, and again, you watch these overblown, completely hyperbolic, uh, hysteric, and you know, I hate to use the word hysterical, but this is what's happening to progressive women, feminist women. Uh, you remember back in the 19th century, and for th hundreds of years before that, even thousands of years before that, uh, women who were emotional to the point of irrationalism were branded hysterical, the word hyster, hysterical, which of course comes from the Greek root for the uterus, right? The idea that there was a certain quality of hysteria that came with women because they had uteruses. There was something in their genetic and their, their, their gender makeup that made them uh, hyper irrational and unable to see logic. And it's ironic to me, and in, in the same way that civil rights has morphed into social justice rights, which are uh, completely different things, so too this concept of hysteria, which men faultily, foolishly branded women with, is now apl applicable to radical leftist feminists who are hysterical in their defense of a woman's right to destroy her child, and adamant and un an unedging and unwilling to compromise and unwilling to discuss the possibility, so rooted are they in their politics, so hysterical are they in their uh, attempt to break free from an objectification that then allows them to objectify, and we see this with patriarchy, right, on college campuses. Feminist professors have no problem using slurs against men, uh, and this is what happens when we take an issue as complicated as this and related to so many other broad rights issues and we narrow it and, and re refuse to look at it any other way but through the lens of contemporary politics. That's what allows modern feminists in university to say the most disgusting things about men, the most generalized things about men, toxic masculinity. We're teaching young boys now that simply to be born male is a form of poison that has to be removed from their blood, that the only way they can shake off the toxicity of their own manhood is to not be men. And this is the same argument you're getting from the heritons at Planned Parenthood, the abortocentric left, as I call them, who don't want to discuss about any aspect of this other than what they want for their very narrow constituency. We've, the debate has, has spun the way it's spun about abortion precisely because of this tribal tunnel vision. And what Stanton, Katie Stanton says is exactly right. When we consider that women are treated as property, and we, and we don't deny that they have been, they are, and ironically, uh, much more so in non-Western countries. Much, much more so are women treated as, object, as objects. Uh, women are treated as property in non-Western cultures today than they are in Western culture. Yet you'll never hear these feminists scholars calling out third world countries, calling out the Islamic world, you'll never hear that. They're too busy griping about uh, the made up wage gap in this country or the fact that uh, the, the, the right of a woman to destroy the child she carries is somehow under threat. Uh, and we can't have moral and ethical discussions because of this kind of rhetoric. And, and what I think Stanton said all those years ago was if women argue that they are objectified property, uh, then we cannot then, it, we, how can we argue we're empowering them when we allow them to do the same thing to the children they carry? The third quote, also from uh, an important female voice, Frederica Matthews Green, she once said, and I think this is right too, and it fits perfectly with the previous two statements, abortion is not a sign that women are free, but a sign that they are desperate. That freedom, the, what a false parallel we give women, that the right to destroy their children is freedom. In what pre-biblical Dagon temple, destroy, feed your kids to Moloch sort of world do we make that false equivalent? It is not empowering to empower women to destroy the life they carry. That's just not empowering. Uh, choice, this idea that I've already mentioned, we, we haven't given choice, the choice to destroy, the choice to murder anyone to any liberated people at any time. And no one in the history of the world has granted that privilege to them. And the idea that uh, what we have here from uh, Alveda King and then Elizabeth Cady Stanton and now uh, Frederica Matthews Green makes a lot of sense in the same context. Abortion is not a sign that women are free, not in the least. In fact, abortion is a kind of prison. It's a kind, of, it's not empowering at all. It's demeaning, it's demeaning uh, to the woman. And it is also a form of destruction. And so when she says that they're desperate, I, I like that word, because that implies a spiritual crisis. It implies uh, an ethical and emotional crisis. 
Abortion is not a sign that women are free. It's a sign that women are desperate. They're desperate for men to be men and, and for families to be families. They're desperate, again, for a culture where pregnancy, the root of motherhood, where pregnancy is valued again, where the consequences of sex are more important than the pleasure of sex, where the consequences of trust and commitment and support are more important than fleeting fun and romance. That world, I think, is the one that drives desperation away. A world where families are reconstructed, not d ripped apart. The idea that the mother, and notice how that logical, uh, the, the reductive logic of that just progresses. If women don't need men, and women don't need marriage, and women don't need families, then women don't need babies. In fact, it's an obvious corollary of that. You could even put that first. Women, flip it around, women don't need babies. And if that's true, then they certainly don't need men or relationships, and then they certainly don't need families. Either way you slice that, you look at it front and back, there's a series of really dangerous assumptions there that most women who claim to abor uh, support abortion would not agree with those chains of thought all the way either. And that's the thing that's so compelling to me. When we think about how this idea is kept alive, again, by the radical left, on the radical left's absolute insistence that empowerment can only come through hatred, through destruction, uh, through killing in this instance, that there is a certain uplifting empowerment to being able to destroy the child you carry. Why is your liberation dependent on the destruction of another? If you go back to Mrs. King, we can compare that to racism. I think we can do that absolutely. We can compare it to another, a number of other things, uh, desperation. And rather than look at the question of this desperation, because I think that's a question that feminism should be pursuing. What is this desperation? What is the desperation that drives a young woman to destroy the child she carries? But, you got, but to answer that question, you have to step out outside the realm of simply simple biology and sexual politics. What is it that leads to a situation culturally where we value sex so highly, sex becomes such a critically important thing to us, that rather than be more responsible or abstain from sex or wait for sex and marriage to gel, rather than those things, we see it as a kind of liberation to have as much sex as we want without consequence. And this is a big problem, it seems to me. Uh, it's a hallmark of the modern world, and, and the farther we move from ph real philosophy, philosophy is dying in our universities, the, fa the farther we move from real philosophical discourse, the closer we get to a kind of anarchy, that what we want in the modern technological scientific age is to be able to have what we want without consequence. To me, this is the single greatest problem behind all of these issues, not just abortion. It is this idea that now that we are not beholden to God philosophically, now that we are not ourselves created, it's this weird notion that we're almost self-made, right? That the woman who, is, who grows to adulthood has no then connection with the child in the womb that she once was and the mother who carried that child and gave birth to that child, oftentimes not in the most optimal situations for her. You know, I've talked to many women, right? It's almost never a good time to get pregnant, right? Pregnancy almost never comes for any woman or family at the correct time. And what's so compelling about this argument is, is that you can see how in every other way it makes sense. And this is going to be a hallmark of our four hours. If you look at, the, at abortion not simply as an issue of a mother's right to choose the destruction of her baby, if you look at it more in the line of, of very similar other discussions about life and responsibility and privilege and freedom, bringing in issues of, of what happened in the Holocaust, bringing up issues about genocide, bringing about issues, we've already done it, of the civil rights movement, and what is justice and what is not justice, right? That the empowering, for instance, uh, would it be empowering? when we freed the gas, the gas chambers of the remaining survivors of the Holocaust to immediately get those people back up and healthy and then give them something like, like, the, like the movie The Purge, give them 28, 48 hours, give them a month to rampage through Germany, killing anybody who happened to have been German at that time who didn't fight against their occupation in the gas camps. And while we might understand the visceral Hollywood justice of that, the, the spaghetti Western vigilante justice of that, we would never authorize such a thing. Because we recognize that that kind of empowering violence in the name of violence doesn't fix anything. Uh, what did Gandhi once say? An eye for an eye makes the world blind. Uh, a murder for a murder, right? Uh, an objectification for an objectification. Men have objectified women as property. Women will then objectify their children as property. And on and on it goes. When you look at it in broad, broader context like that, this isn't that complicated of a moral or an ethical issue. Uh, go back to Frederica Mar Matthews Green's quote. Abortion is not a sign that women are free, but a sign that they are desperate. And rather than ask the desperate question, because desperation is a consequence of all, I think, of our, our fallen humanity. What is it that we want? 
if we devo- dev- d- divorce ourselves from teleology, the argument that life has meaning beyond just the material and the animal, if we begin to suggest the argument that there is a greater reality, and this is the stuff of fairy tales, right? This is the stuff of, of Dis- what Disney, use, Dis- Disney movies used to be. The idea that there is something beyond the material realm, that there is a higher order, a higher power. There's meaning and purpose to life. If we, if we embrace those ideas here in a broader context, then the destruction of children, allowing mothers to destroy their children, and I, and I make a distinction, we have to make a distinction, don't we, I suppose, between uh, abortion as birth control and abortion for legitimate medical reasons, um, a mother who's dying and who may die to carry a pregnancy to term, that's a, it's a whole other moral and ethical issue. And one, thank God, that happens really rarely comparatively. But you think about the vast majority, the vast bulk of abortions that are carried out in this country daily and worldwide daily that are nothing more but post-factum birth control, birth control after the fact of conception. These are not the same issues when you look at them that way. And what is the desperate cause that causes women to have these consequences? Can, Can we make the argument here that the sexual revolution, that feminism and the sexual revolution did not empower women at all, it enslaved them? It did not empower women at all, but it hung them out to dry in many ways, in the same way that the civil rights movement uh, and and the kind of paternalistic big government solutions that arose in the wake of civil rights drove apart African-American families, drove apart minority families, ultimately destroyed the American family altogether, making men useless in in the home. The sexual revolution, which argued not that men should elevate their game when it came to, when it comes to chastity and responsibility, and that women should continue to hold them to a higher standard than culture does. That Kate, what along came the argument that the better way is to make women as libertine as men, to throw out the rules for men, uh, or to, uh, to apply the same rules to women that we apply to men, the double standard. That when men are uh, incontinent and uh, per- perverse and, and sexually progressive at earlier ages, uh, that we must be like them rather than educating them. And if you say to me, look me in the eye and you say to me, it's not our job as women to educate men, well, history would tell you a different story. Women down through the ages who got to control courtship, who did not have, didn't, who refused their own personal choice to engage in sexuality until they encountered a partner that they knew through long engagement or courtship that they could trust, that was going to be there for them, that would be a willing and an able partner in a relationship in which children could come. Uh, women had a lot of power there. When you, when you get to this kind of uh, morally anarchi- anarchistic world where the libertine nature of men now must be echoed by women in order to have equality, well, the reality is men don't get pregnant. And the reality is it's much easier for anatomically and biologically for women to get certain kinds of diseases from sex than it is for men to get them. This idea, this radical idea that equality means men and women have to be the same is really destroying women, much more than it's destroying men. And that's part of the problem. So what are the causes of this desperation? Abortion is not a sign that women are free, but a sign that they are desperate. I certainly, Anne B. Ross, this is a powerful one, I certainly supported a woman's right to choose, but to my mind, the time to choose was before, not after the fact. All right, that's a really powerful statement. Effectively, what it's saying is that the minute you uh, agree to have sex, heterosexual sex in this context with a man, you are agreeing to the possibility of life, uh, and you have absolute choice over that. The when and how you engage in sexual behavior, the, 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 the meds, modus, the modus, the means, the, operandi, the modus operandi, the means, the method, how you go about engaging in sexual behavior, that's a choice. That's a powerful choice. And notice that we refuse to, impl- to impose any, any caveats on that choice. We have the right with our bodies, men and women, to choose any way, any how, any way we can without any consequence. There shouldn't be consequence. We have, we have this absolute moral authority to use our bodies sexually that we keep telling kids. Then when it comes to the consequences of that sex, po- the possibility of childbirth, we, we come 180 degrees around the other way, and there must be the radical option of killing it. Right? And what Andy Ross says here is powerful. Of course, right? if we support a woman's right to choose, in almost everything. We, again, we don't let men choose debt to kill in the final analysis to, to free themselves. I certainly supported a woman's right to choose, but to my mind, the time to choose for a woman was before, not after the fact. Somehow, the consequences of the, 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 more, the more obvious and the more life-threatening the consequences, the more, the more life-sacred the consequences, uh, the less we want to have those kinds of scrupulous moral considerations. Uh, the possibility to kill must be endless. So I so certainly supported that woman's right to choose, but not after the fact. Mother Teresa, 
chimed in with what I think is a very important quote. It ties exactly into what we've been talking about here. Mother Teresa once said, any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love, but to use violence to get what they want. Now, that's remarkable, too. Any country that accepts abortion, any people who embrace it, any political party who make it the central platform, the sacred sacrament of their platform, uh, any religion that kowtows to the idea, any, any individual that, or country that accepts the, that abortion is not, accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love. Love is best defined as selflessness. You go all the way back to Alveda King, right, who argued that racism, like abortion, is just ignorance and selfishness. And what Mother Teresa said is exactly right. You are not teaching people to love by empowering them to kill in the name of politics. What you are doing, however, is teaching them to use violence to get what they want. Uh, I will talk about this in later episodes, but if you, th you think about the degree to which countries like Iceland uh, in the European Union are boasting now that they have effectively eradicated Down syndrome from the entire country of Iceland. Apparently not a single Down syndrome baby was born in the tiny country of Iceland last year. And that's because any mother who was, all mothers received ultrasound. And the minute an ultrasound or any other medical test suggested even a, a, a slight remote possibility that a baby might be Down syndrome, uh, the, the abortion industry swept in, the doctors pushed the mother to abort the baby. So even the possibility of giving birth to a Down syndrome baby meant many babies in Iceland were aborted. This is is no other way to phrase it. It's a kind of genocide. And you're also killing many babies who would not have been born Down syndrome on the chance that one might have been. And to boast about this is not love. It is not progress. It is the destruction of people willfully, the destruction of an entire subset of people. These people who would have been born. We all have friends and neighbors who are Down syndrome and live with Down syndrome. And we don't see those lives inherently as worse than ours. Uh, the best of us, the ones who love and serve and care for them, recognize that in some ways their lives are better than ours in the sense of their innocence and their simpleness and the, the way they can relate to life, the way oftentimes uh, human beings in those positions uh, can offer us real insights in how we live. The fact that a country like Iceland and other places are following suit, France has a high number, uh, Denmark had a high number, very few, very few Down syndrome babies born, because you are willfully destroying not just them in the womb, but even babies that might have been. You think about that for a second. If, if a mother gets a, 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 a doctor report that says, well, there's a 40% chance that the baby you carry might be a Down syndrome baby, we, we really, really recommend that you abort this baby, and apparently all mothers in Iceland do so, uh, then it, it's a victory for what exactly? Uh, the idea that my child is my child if my child is normal, or what we perceive to be normal. Uh, and if I have to take the, a 60% chance of destroying a child that I otherwise would have given birth to if it didn't have a chance at, at, at Down syndrome, uh, being Down syndrome, then I'll love it less, I'll love it more. Any country that accepts abortion, that accepts that abortion is not teaching its people love, but to use violence, right? Any country that accepts abortion is not teaching its people to love, but to use violence, actual violence and murder to get what they want. And finally, simple, right, Ronald Reagan. I've noticed that everyone who is for an abortion has already been born. And that's Gipper-esque, it's pithy, it's concise, it's brevity is the soul of wit, but it's also deeply profound. And it talk, ties in with every one of the qu quotes from the other ladies we've seen in, in this, this section. That it's a social justice issue, isn't it? Or what I prefer to call a civil rights issue, given how screwy social justice has become. It's a civil rights issue. The, the, they don't have a voice, these babies. I've noticed that everyone who is pro-abortion already was born, that they weren't able to and did not protest their own birth, that their mothers did not uh, willfully seek abortion, the destruction of their children. Uh, and so everybody who is pro-abortion has already been born. And there is a sense of fundamental injustice of this. If we stop the politicization of the issue of abortion for a moment, we, we separate it from its manipulative uh, and overriding feminist concerns. If we get the ghouls out of it, the Cecile Richards, the Planned Parenthoods out of it, who make a lot of money off it and promote it, promote it in the schools as part of a feminist agenda, as part of a, uh, an empowering agenda, as part of an anti-patriarchy agenda, we separate those things out. The very same people, uh, the progressive left, who is constantly making these kinds of social justice observations, they would not in a million years accept this if you applied it in almost any other circumstance. But in the circumstance that advances, advances their politics, they do. Reagan was wise. Uh, everyone, who has, everyone who is for abortion 
has already had the luxury of childbirth. And that says something, that those who are against abortion, right, everybody who wants it for themselves and for others, they, that option wasn't exercised on them. And so it's a compelling point. If we think about the, again, and that's going to be the premise of our four-part talk, to consider seriously abortion as part of larger issues of, so, of justice, civil rights, larger issues of human justice and divine justice, larger issues of life and death and faith and understanding, then it is really not so complicated an issue. And we, we always are skeptical of the legal issue because for, for how many years was slavery legal? Slavery, and the people who, who, who believed slavery was biblical and belonged in the, in, in the legal category and willfully practiced slavery because of its efficacy in terms of, of economic growth, still nevertheless we know. We know now that that was not a moral argument. It wasn't a moral argument for them then and it's not now. And I don't see how in retrospect you're going to be able to justify the killing of infants because it's a, somehow a mother's prerogative. And we go back to the ancient world we see in a quick overview here. Uh, abortion has been with us forever. Ever since there were men and women, there were babies. Uh, there were abortions, and there were women seeking abortions, and there were men, too, who pressed abortions upon their women. Uh, all the way back to e ancient Egypt in 5 1550 BC, we have a reference to abortion in the Ebers papyrus, which discusses use the use of pessary treatments. A pessar uh, pessary treatment is a, the insertion of something gynecologically into a woman uh, that would block or would be coated, would be a, a compound of some kind that would be dragged directly inserted into the woman, that would cause the, the they thought anyway, they would cause the, the, the baby to miscarry or the baby to be prematurely aborted. As early as 1550 BC, we have those uh, re remedies. One of them is really interesting. It was based on crocodile dung. Uh, take crocodile dung, which apparently does have some sort of uh, prophylactic uh, semen killing properties, uh, um, spermicidal properties. Take alligator dung and crocodile dung and mix it with dough and use it as a pessary. Uh, that would they believe would help to uh, stop uh, children from being born or developing. As early as 500 BC, we have Chinese folklore dates that use actually the, the use of mercury. This is very, very dangerous, right? Using mercury to induce abortion, uh, going all the way back 5,000 years. Uh, abortion in the Old Testament. From the book of Numbers in the, New in the Old Testament, we have the following. There was kind of in a people, this is a kind of a vague area of the New Testament, but many have described this as a kind of, of, of abortion and miscarriage uh, uh, treatment. Uh, and the priest, here's how it reads And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord. A woman who is suspected of having had sex with a man who wasn't her husband, and the possibility of a child emanating from that adultery. What would happen? And the priest shall set the woman before the Lord and uncover the woman's head, and put the offering of the memorial in her hands, which is the jealousy offering. And what is this jealousy offering? It was a kind of bitter water that she drank, that if apparently she was pregnant from another man, that baby would miscarry. If she drank the water and still conceived and gave birth to a child, that meant that the child must have been the actual father's. And so they would uncover her head and they would put into the priest shall have in his hand the bitter water that causes the curse. And the priest shall charge her by an oath and say unto the woman, if no man have lain with thee, if thou, and if thou hast not gone aside to uncleanness with another instead of thy husband, if not, then be thou free from this bitter water that causes the curse. And this idea that even in the Old Testament, uh, this is not necessarily... Uh, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's a very open-ended, lots of people have commented on all sorts of ways about this, but if you go all the way back to Numbers and where Moses is dealing with his people, uh, how do you handle, if adultery is a great sin, uh, one that could even result potentially in death, then what about the consequences of that adultery and how is it how dealt with in the ancient world? And from the Judeo, the Judeo world over to the Greek, the Hellenic world, abortion in ancient Greece. Um, and an interesting thing about this, in most instances, we saw in the, the case of the Hebrews, uh, the priest himself was the one who administered the bitter water. But in most primitive cultures and most early cultures, it's women. Women and particularly midwives. Doctors tended to be physicians and men. Uh, birth, childbirth and particularly uh, abortion and contraception, that more or less belonged to the midwife. Women uh, mediating other women's uh, sexual health. Women and midwives. As early as 445, to the, the poet Lysias, in the, from 440, born in 445, died in 380 BC, actually called abortion, quote, a crime against the husband if the wife was pregnant when he died. 
if a man died and the wife was pregnant and then she aborted that baby, it was an actual crime against the husband uh, for all sorts of legacy and property reasons. Plato himself, the great Plato, 428, 348 BC, in his Theotetus once mentioned, midwives mentions the idea of midwives actually terminating pregnancies at various times. And in the ancient world, you know, there, are, there was no hard and fast rule. It depended upon what you thought the child was. If you go a little bit further in the ancient world, Hippocrates, the great founder of modern medicine on whom the Hippocratic Oath is based, that doctors theoretically are still supposed to take from 360, 460 to 370 BC, he actually forbade the use of pessaries to induce abortion, the insertion of chemicals or objects uh, into the woman gynecologically that would impede or destroy a developing child. And Aristotle, the great father of modern science, born in 384, died in 322 BC, said, quote, the line between lawful and unlawful abortion will be marked by the fact of having sensation and being alive. So for Aristotle, back before, and, and Aristotle really was the fir world's first great embryologist, the first person to actually consider the development of a child in the womb. He actually at, would at one point would held, hold up chicken eggs to the bright Athenian sun, the bright Greek sun, and he could mark every day he drew a little picture to show how the embryo developed into a chick. And his point here is, is that whatever an embryo is, it becomes a human life the minute two things are present. One of them is what? It is sensation, and the other is life, the idea of being alive, being able to move. And of course, the irony about almost everything we're talking about here so far is that modern science uh, has made all of this clearer, not less clear, that modern, in all these pre-modern cultures, when they didn't know when life began or what necessarily, uh, there's no way for them to really monitor a baby growing in a woman's womb. Now, there's a big difference between a chick developing in an egg and a human child developing in a mother's, in a mother's uterus. And so there was no really compelling way uh, for these researchers to, to look at this. Uh, and yet, w that caused huge problems. Go, uh, go a little further. T two different strands of Greek thought. You had the Stoic and you had the Pythagorean, both of them highly influential p philosophical positions. The Stoics argued that in the very early stages, a developing baby is akin to a plant in nature. It's not quite human yet until it becomes ensouled or quickened in some degree. Sensation and life, right? So an early, in the very early stages of pregnancy, according to the Stoics, a developing baby was like a plant in nature. It was alive, but it wasn't quickened. It couldn't move. It didn't feel. It had no sensation. And not an animal, an animal meaning a human, a creature, until the moment of birth. For them, it was when the child finally breathed air. However, for the Pythagoreans, and the Pythagorean philosophy tended to be a little bit more dominant in the ancient world, soul infused in body from conception. That conception itself was an action in which sperm and egg came together, and in that coming together, you, the, the, the creature was ensouled. Uh, that was when the soul, and that, consequently that was when life, and that was when sensation it was infused. And the thing that's so remarkable about this, again, is with modern science. You think about the modern scientific revolution, the more scientists knows about babies in womb, in utero, the more and the earlier and the sooner we begin to attribute to them more and more almost every 10 years, more and more and earlier and earlier, we begin to argue what, abortion, uh, what uh, Aristotle would have argued, that this child is a child almost from the very beginning, if not from the very beginning. Jump ahead to the next one, uh, abortion in ancient Rome. The Romans, too, had a very mixed cultural and political history when it comes to abortion. Uh, the Roman Empire, uh, we have the Republican period of Rome from about 700 BC to about uh, 29 AD, 29 BC, excuse me, all the way from 750 down to about 29 AD when Rome actually became an empire, moving forward after the uh, uh, reign of Julius, after the, king, the, the, the assassination of Julius Caesar and the rise of his, his nephew Augustus, who became the first Roman emperor. In that long, long period of the Roman Republic, slightly different than what was going to come in the empire period of Rome. But abortion in ancient Rome mixed cultural political history. In the Roman Republic, uh, the first big chunk of the Roman Empire before the birth of Christ, abortion was punishable because it interfered with the father's right to oversee his offspring. It got in the way of parental oversight broadly of children. It raised all sorts of legacy issues and inheritance issues. Uh, now, it's true that in both the Greek and Roman world, uh, midwives and women on the street would practice uh, odd kinds of birth control and retroactive birth control, that once a mother, young mother thought she had conceived, there were herbs and spices. We, all, we talked about some of the 
concoctions of the ancient Egyptians to try to stymie or inhibit or destroy pregnancy as it developed. So you had these, much like today, remember the argument before abortion was legal, all the so-called back alley abortions, this idea that modern feminism defaults to again, that if you ban legal safe abortion, legal and so-called safe abortion, then women will just find out odd ways to do it and it'll be more dangerous for the mothers. Uh, pretty much equally as dangerous for the child. The uh, the legislator, the, the great commentator on the law, Scribonius Largus, who was born in 1 AD, died about 50 AD, he wrote about Hippocrates, wrote about the Greeks. He said, quote, Hippocrates, who founded the medical profession, laid the foundation for our discipline by an oath in which it was prescribed not to give a pregnant woman any kind of medicine that expels the embryo, right? And this is, this is a, the, a fundamental hallmark of the Hippocratic Oath. The first injunction to the doctor is do no harm. To destroy a baby, a healthy baby, and an otherwise healthy mother, for no other reason than the convenience of the mother, is doing harm. It is harmful. It is an unhealthy procedure, and it is destructive to the child. And, the, and it's interesting that as we become more progressive in our medicine, the Hippocratic Oath now is being slightly amended, isn't it? Some doctors aren't taking it, or there's a kind of an upgraded version that does away with some of the moral and ethical concerns of doctoring, uh, the ones that, that had survived Western culture well for thousands of years. The uh, Ulpian, the great uh, philosopher, as early as 170, was born in 170, died 223 AD, he said basically, quote, an unborn child is considered being born as far as it concerns what profits him. An unborn child we must consider as being born as far as it concerns those things that are owed it, those things that it can inherit, those things that it has a right and a title to. And that's a remarkably uh, uh, modern statement when you think about it. And then, of course, we've got the idea that with the christening of Rome, with the idea that Rome was uh, impo impacted by the ev evolution of Christian philosophy, by the fourth century AD, R uh, Rome had fallen to Christ. This is one of the mar remarkable stories of history, that when Christ died in the first century, 300, year later, 300 years later, without a war, uh, without any bloodshed that the Christians had administered, uh, the Christian ideals, purely philosophical ideals of Christianity, sort of carried the day. And it was a completely bloodless uh, uh, coup with the Emperor Constantine embracing Christian philosophy philosophy. And with the Christianizing of Rome came change. As abortion was banned by the first emperors, uh, in the, slightly in the, the pre-Christian era, Septimus Severus, who, who ruled Rome from 193 to 211 AD, and Caracalla from 198 to 270, both these emperors banned abortion on the grounds that it compromised the rights of parents. And what we're going to do when I see you next time is, now that we've led up to the Christian era, we've, we've put some questions on the table, and I, and I want to emphasize again what I think the method has to be. Let's consider abortion not as its own thing, but let's cons consider the issues of life and responsibility, the right to protect life, the right to sustain life, the right to destroy life, the right to an individual's choice. Let's consider this issue, because in every, every way it is, like other such issues of life and death. I love going back to what Alveda King said. Why do we consider abortion different than slavery or uh, racism? Why do we look at the rights to life and abortion differently than we would look at other civil rights and human rights struggles? It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, other than the industry abor of abortion, which is high on legalities and law, uh, by, and by law, I mean legal wrangling, and very, very, very adamant uh, uh, that the voiceless should have no representation to broader understandings and conceptions of these things. And so we left off the history of abortion right at the dawning of the Christian era. And what we're going to do in section two is we're going to carry it forward and look at how Christian Europe for about 1,500, actually about 1,400 years, considered the question where abortion flourished and where it was condemned and why it was condemned. And what we're going to do by the end of next hour is we're going to take us right up to the point at which abortion became legal in America, 1973, and uh, a little bit earlier than that all throughout Europe. What was it? What was the thinking? What was the impulse behind the move to make abortion legal? How did it become the law? There's a series of really remarkable, remarkable, and anti-philosophical arguments that were made. And if you actually sit down and read, we'll take quotes from it, take quotes directly from the Roe versus Wade case. It's shocking how arbitrary 
all of it was. None of it is grounded in science, and none of it's really grounded in consistent logical, moral, and ethical thinking. It is very scattered and piecemeal. Most people have never bothered to look at the relatively short Roe versus Wade decision, and so we will do that. And we're going to look at the evolution of abortion and anti-abortion movements in the Christian era, and we are going to consider very carefully the background of these with the legalization of it. And we'll see you next time for part two. Look forward to talking to you then.